Welcome to Philosophical Reactions, an in-depth look at the earliest issues of the world's oldest scientific journal. In our last episode, Robert Hooke and Adrian Ozu got super snippy with each other, Scottish tides were weird, and there was far too much about the making of telescopic lenses. It's been a while since I've got one of these out, so it's only appropriate that this episode be a double header, covering both sides of the four-month gap caused by the outbreak of plague in the summer of 1665. This was the last major outbreak of plague in England, notable for forcing Newton to go home from Cambridge. The time and isolation this gave him allowed for his Annus Mirabilis, the basis of his revolutions in optics, calculus, and gravity, all come from this period. In 50 years, it would also serve to inspire Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year. More importantly for us, the plague caused philosophical transactions to be suspended until publication could resume from Oxford at the end of the year. It would remain there for several months before returning to London just in time for the Great Fire of 1666. So let us go to our favorite coffee house in London through increasingly deserted streets and see if we can find a copy of Philosophical Transactions from Monday, July 3rd, 1665. An account how adits and mines are wrought at liege without air shafts, communicated by Sir Robert Moray. We're getting all De Re Metallica here again, this time describing a technique for ventilating mines. Instead of digging horribly expensive air shafts or using bellows or trying to capture wind, this relies on the draft created by a strong fire to draw air from the depths of the mine along a long series of wooden ducts. The fire in the chimney doth still attract, so to speak, air through the tube, without which it cannot burn, yet which it will do, as is obvious to conceive, all illustrations and philosophical explications here being superfluous. And so, while the air is drawn by the fire from the farthest or most inward part of the mine or adit, fresh air must needs come in from without to supply the place of the other, which by its motion doth carry away with it all the ill vapours that breathe out of the ground, by which means the whole adit will always be filled with fresh air, so that men will there breathe as surely as abroad, and not only candles burn, but fire, when upon occasion there is use for it, or breaking of the rock. A way to break easily and speedily the hardest rocks, communicated by the same person, as he received it from Monsieur Dusson, the inventor. Continuing the theme, here's a neat new way to use gunpowder for blasting in mines. First, drill a hole in the rock, using a drill rod like this. Next, insert the gunpowder, but don't set it off just yet. Most of its force would be wasted shooting out of the hole like a cannon. Instead, drive a set of wedges into the hole as tamping. These are made of wood, and while the article doesn't specify, I strongly recommend the mallet being used to drive them is also made of wood. Sparks would be very bad right now. With that in place and braced externally, you can light a fuse and flee for your life. Which being done, and the man retired, when the powder comes to take fire, it will first drive out the uppermost wedge as far as it will go. But the slanting figure of it, being so made, as the farther it goes backward, the thicker it grows till at the last it can go no further. Then the fire tears the rock to get forth, and so cracks and breaks it all about, that at one time a vast deal of it will either be quite blown out, or so cracked and broken as will make it easy to be removed. Imagine the dense, choking smoke afterwards, feebly lit by flickering candles. And imagine how much worse chipping it away by hand must have been, that the use of black powder was ever common in the first place. Observables on a monstrous head. Another cabinet of curiosities entry, this time specifically the head of a deformed calf. There are some dissection details, including a single optic nerve coming from the two eyes which are fused together. But mostly it just sounds like another awesome death metal band. Observables in the body of the Earl of Belcaris. Another dissection, but this time of a human. I suppose it should be more properly called an autopsy? The skull being opened, 
both the cerebrum and cerebellum were big in proportion to the body, and out of it run much more blood than was seen in both the other regions together. This doesn't say which Earl of Balcaris it was, and the first and second died in quick succession. But it does say that the report came from Scotland, so it was probably the second. The first died in the Netherlands as part of the court and exile of Charles II. I can't find anything about the second Earl at all, beyond these descriptions of his internal organs. However, the ninth Earl of Balcaris, his great-great-great-grandnephew, became a member of the Royal Society, and was even president of the Royal Astronomical Society. He funded several expeditions on his yacht, and liked to collect books and stamps. Of the designed progress to be made in the breeding of silkworms and the making of silk in France. More sericulture. This time it's a review of a recent book, Instructions for the Planting of White Mulberries, the Breeding of Silkworms, and the Ordering of Silk in Paris and the Circumjacent Places, by Christophe Isnar. From the details given, this actually sounds like a really practical and useful guide, if you were interested in starting a sericulture industry. I really like the word sericulture, if you haven't guessed. The society is interested for the honor of England and Virginia, and the increase of wealth to the people thereof, especially since there is a cause of hope that a double silk harvest may be made in one summer in Virginia, without hindering the least the tobacco trade of that country. Inquiries Concerning Agriculture The old Baconian goal of collecting natural histories for every possible subject is not dead. Whereas the Royal Society, in prosecuting the improvements of natural knowledge, have it in design to collect histories of nature and arts, and for that purpose have already, according to the several inclinations and studies of their members, divided themselves into diverse committees to execute the said design. The committee dedicated to all things agricultural has come up with a survey to be distributed to persons experienced in husbandry all over England, Scotland, and Ireland for the procuring a faithful and solid information of the knowledge and practice already obtained and used in these kingdoms. This includes questions such as at what seasons, and how often are they ploughed? What kind of ploughs are used for several sorts of ground? Some of the common accidents and diseases befalling corn in the growth of it, being mildew, blasting, smut. What are conceived to be the causes thereof, and what are the remedies? The common annoyances of these pastoral meadow grounds being supposed to be either weeds, moss, sour grass, heath, fern, bushes, briars, brambles, broom, rushes, sedges, gorse, or furzes. What are the remedies thereof? What are the best ways of draining marshes, bogs, fens, etc.? Advertisement. The reader is hereby advertised that by reason of the present contagion in London, which may unhappily cause an interruption as well of correspondencies as of public meetings, the printing of these philosophical transactions may possibly for a while be intermitted, though endeavours shall be used to continue them, if it may be. And that all-too-familiar warning brings issue number five to an end. The next wouldn't come out until publication could resume from Oxford at the end of the year. So, after several very boring months isolating in our country estate, out of an abundance of caution, let's eagerly open issue number six for Monday, November 6th, 1665. An opportunity being presented to revive the publishing of these papers, which for some months have been discontinued by reason of the great mortality in London, where they were begun to be printed. It hath been thought fit to embrace the same, and to make use thereof for the gratifying of the curious that have been pleased to think well of such communications. An account of a not ordinary burning concave, lately made at Lyon, and compared with several others made formerly. Multiple reports, one in French, one in Latin, 
have been received of a very fearsome burning concave or parabolic mirror. It is 30 inches across and... The burning point is distant from the center of the glass, about three feet. The focus is about half a louis d'or large. One may pass one's hand through it, if it be done nimbly. For if it stay there the time of a second minute, there is danger of receiving much hurt. Second minute? If it takes two whole minutes to burn your hand, that doesn't sound like a very powerful mirror. Well, that's definitely not what is meant here, but we'll have to dive into some etymology first to understand. Minutes and seconds originally come from geometry, using the base 60 Babylonian notation popularized by Ptolemy. The different places didn't originally have names, those came out informally later. So the first division of the original whole into sixtieths was a small part, minuta parta in Latin. The further division of those into sixtieths was the second small part, or secunda minuta parta. Eventually, these just became minutes and seconds. And when horology finally got good enough to start tracking parts of an hour, and then parts of those parts, the names just followed. So this mirror can burn your hand if you leave it in the focus for more than a single second. Much more impressive. At the risk of compounding tangent with tangent, this raises an interesting question. Babylonian notation wasn't limited to just minutes and seconds. It can go arbitrarily deep, same as any modern positional numbering system. Ptolemy mostly only used minutes and seconds because that was more than enough. An arc second is a legitimately tiny thing. The full moon as seen from the Earth covers about 30 arc minutes, or half of one degree. Within that span are 1800 arc seconds, each well beyond the angular resolution of the unaided human eye. But everyone wants to show off occasionally, and at one point Ptolemy calculates the mean daily motion of the sun to an extra four places deeper past mere seconds. What would you call those parts? Well, extending the Latin for a third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, you would get tertium minuta parta, quarta minuta parta, quintus minuta parta, and sextus minuta parta. Working from there and applying a bit of linguistic sandpaper for the passage of centuries, we could reasonably deduce that minutes and seconds would be followed by terts, quarts, quints, and sexts, had there ever been a need for such precision before the triumph of base 10. Anyway, back to the burning concave. It can burn and melt almost anything, as shown in the accompanying table. It was bought by one Monsieur de Alibert, who paid an incredible 1,500 livres for it. The equivalent of several tens of thousands of dollars today, to depending on exactly how you want to figure the inflation. This was pre-industrial revolution, and I'm not convinced there's any rigorous way to translate values across that divide. But it was definitely a very expensive mirror. An advertisement, the way of making more lively counterfeits of nature in wax than are extant in painting, and of a new kind of maps in a low relievo, both practiced in France. Informed by the ingenious Mr. Evelyn, the Society has been informed of the existence of wax figures, which had only recently been developed into the highly realistic forms that we now associate with the medium. Madame Tussaud wouldn't be born for another hundred years, however. He would also like us to know about the exciting development of dioramas. I have also seen a new kind of maps in low relievo or sculpture. For example, the Isle of Antibes, upon a square of about eight foot, made of boards with a frame like a picture. There is represented the sea, with ships and other vessels artificially made, with their cannons and tackle of wood fixed upon the surface, after a new and most admirable manner. The rocks about the island exactly formed, as they are upon the natural place, and the island itself with all its inequalities and hills and dales, the town, the forts, the little houses, platform and cannons mounted, and even the gardens and platforms of trees with their green leaves standing upright, as if they were growing in their natural colors. In fine, men, beasts, and whatever you may imagine to have any protuberancy above the level of the sea. This new, delightful and most instructive form of map, or wooden country, you are to look upon either horizontally or sidelong, and it affords equally a very pleasant object. Maps are cool. 3D maps? Even cooler. 
some anatomical observations of milk found in veins instead of blood, and of grass found in the windpipes of some animals. Various reports of finding substances in animals one wouldn't expect to find there. These have been passed on by Mr. Boyle. More on that later. Of a place in England where, without petrifying water, wood is turned into stone. A place has been found that can turn wood into stone, though not through water, but through sandy earth itself. Oddly enough, the article doesn't bother to specify the location. I don't know exactly what effect this would be, but petrifying waters really are a thing. Kind of. There are some springs which have such a high mineral content that items left in the water will fairly quickly accumulate a stony shell around them. They were tourist attractions back then, and they are tourist attractions still today. All thanks go, of course, to Tom Scott for making me aware of this in the first place. Of the nature of a certain stone, found in the Indies, in the head of a serpent. There was, some while ago, sent by Sir Filiberto Vernati from Java Mayor, where he resides, to Sir Robert Moray, for the repository of the Royal Society, a certain stone, affirmed by the presenter to be found in the head of a snake, which laid upon any wound made by any venomous creature, is said to stick to it and to draw away all poison, and then, being put in milk, to void its poison therein and to make the milk turn blue, in which manner it must be used till the wound be cleansed. This would be a snake stone or black stone, a folk medical treatment that goes back to at least 13th century Persia. They can be made in a variety of ways, often involving animal bones. Perhaps not too surprisingly, modern medical studies have found no benefits to their use. Of the way, used in the Mughal's dominions to make saltpetre. Saltpeter, or potassium nitrate, can be used for fertilizer or curing meats. But at this period in history, it was most important for its use in making gunpowder, of which it makes up a full three quarters by weight. Any insight into its production could be of vital national importance. This article describes a technique of saltpeter extraction from mineral sources in the villages around Agra, a practice which dates back at least 2,000 years in India. That long predates its use in gunpowder, but it does seem to have been weaponized for some kind of chemical warfare. Of the Mundus Subterraneus of Athanasius Kircher. This reviews a book on the underground world which had just come out. Before getting to the content, though, the review has to make it very, very clear that Kircher is Catholic, and in fact an open supporter of both the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. This was just not something that could go unstated in Restoration England. Otherwise, this is a very favorable review of what sounds like a fairly fantastical book. Subjects covered include The Philosopher's Stone and What is meant by it, and whether by means thereof true gold can be produced. The chain of mountains, so drawn over the earth, that they make, as it were, an axis, passing from pole to pole, and several transverse ductus, so cutting that axis as to make, in a manner, an equator and tropics of mountains. An account of that famous and strange whirlpool upon the coasts of Norway, commonly called the Maelstrom, which the author fancies to have communication by a subterraneous channel with another such whirlpool in the Bodnik Bay. It also addresses the important question, in how much time a swallow can fly about the world. But my Latin isn't good enough to see if it specifies the exact species. A farther account of an observation above mentioned about white blood. Hold the presses! During printing of this issue, more information was received by Mr. Boyle about milky blood. A brief account is given of a maid whose blood turned white immediately after being bled, despite otherwise seeming completely healthy. And that's it for issue number six of Philosophical Transactions in Exile, printed in Oxford. I'll be giving a short presentation inspired by this series at the upcoming Ignite Talk hosted by the Long Now Foundation, so watch for that on May 25th. And of course, be sure to like and subscribe if you want more history of science, metalworking, historical recreations, and whatever else captures my attention. Cheers!